Okay, I'm just going to start with uh, a, a book announcement. And uh, so this book has uh, just recently been released. It's the highest uh, seller on um, Amazon right now for the environment. And so I'm going to give out, I'm going to have three questions during my presentation. And I'd like SRAG not to be the ones that jump up because they might have heard these questions before. Uh, so anybody around the room can do that. Um, this book uh, covers uh, virtually everything we've been hearing about today, uh, and we're providing solutions, providing deep uh, insight into um, how we can move ahead. Also QR codes to get you into uh, the kids version, um, the, the, obviously the, uh, the printed version, and uh, every page in this has uh, a wealth of resources. If you click on the, the page, you can get um, maybe 50 or 60 re uh, references to any part of that. So let me just uh, start my presentation. I'm Sorry? It's a great book. Okay, thank you. <laughs> All right. Uh, and uh, so uh, imagine uh, blue carbon. So we've been talking a little bit today about blue carbon. Uh, let's ref essentially refer to everything that's uh, below water, on in the water, and anything that's touching the water. Okay, so that's blue carbon. And now I want to talk about uh, global grants and opportunities for global grants in particular. Um, I'm uh, in SRAG now, I'm the senior advisor for SRAG, um, and because I've turned out as a, a director of, of SRAG, and my focus, as I mentioned, is on global grants. Uh, so friends, here it is. Um, uh, so this is today's menu, really quickly. Um, and uh, you can read that there, but I'm just going to skip that because we don't have very much time. Uh, but this is what we're going to be looking at. And so we've been hearing about uh, the, the world having 70% uh, uh, saltwater oceans and seas. 1% is uh, fresh water and, uh, in streams and rivers and lakes. And the remaining 29% of land actually has water in it. Okay, so we're all uh, dependent on water as, as uh, this. Um, was mentioning before, after World War II, um, th there was a, a common phrase, fight pollution by dilution. And that was, uh, I, I, I remember that when I was about five years old, my mother was saying, okay, how do we deal with uh, pollution? You flush it down the toilet, flush it through, through the water system. However, now the chemistry in there um, was and is, is extremely important. I'm gonna be giving a presentation on the 24th of, uh, this month on uh, Rachel Carson's book, Silent Spring. Uh, and that is, uh, that book drew attention to the fact that we can poison virtually everything, anything. And now 60 years later, we've learned some lessons from that, but we're still doing it. Um, and uh, my, my picture up here is the turtle can really uh, survive in a Sargasso Sea, but it can't survive, and sorry to do that focus, um, but in plastics. Uh, and these plastic gyres and the, and the Sagasa Sea, which is a gyre, um, basically operate exactly the same way, but the, the turtle has no chance in, in a process um, of Okay, so here we are. What, um, where are we? We're still, still going wrong. We're cutting 15.3 billion trees down a year. How many trees is Rotary planting a year to make any action into building that nature solution back. Um, we have been cutting down trees for at least 10,000 years. Um, and so we've been doing continuous deforestation. You think about England, England talks about the green hills of England, but England was a forest one time. And, and uh, so then uh, with, with the, uh, industrial agriculture, uh, we have uh, now talked Talking across the United States, we talk about climate smart agriculture. Some people, uh, regenerative agriculture is another term for it, but in the EPA, uh, EPA and USDA, we're talking about climate uh, smart solutions for that, um, which basically tries to keep carbon in the ground. They, since the, since the uh, Dust Bowl, we've been trying to keep carbon in the ground. They, they've had lots of, of ways of, of uh, trying to do that, um, and but. No, we're starting to overfishing. We've, we've heard this morning we're vastly overfishing, um, way beyond the, the, the ability for fish to, to replenish themselves. And we know that because we are now catching fish that were large, 
Now they're smaller and they're still acceptable. And so this is, uh, that we're actually not letting fish get to the age where they need to be uh, to, to reproduce. Talking about mangroves, but talking about virtually everything, in the past 50 years, we have diminished a lot of these forests by 50%. Um, and we've been hearing a lot about uh, pollution um, from heat and uh, from fossil fuels in particular, leading to temperature rise around, around the world. And we, we can talk a little bit more about that in a minute. Uh, pollution from insecticides and herbicides, killing virtually everything. Um, and then pollution from plastics and microplastics. These are being absorbed by all of us right now. We've heard this the other day. But uh, animals see often the plastics as food, and then they're, they're, they're feeding that to the, their infants. Those bellies of those infants are then full of plastics, and the, the, they die. Birds in particular, you see this happening all the time. Uh, so in a perspective, I would like to say that 92% of our decline uh, over the last two, two uh, hundred years has been through habitat loss, uh, ecosystem services disruption, um, human destruction, and the diseases because everything's coming closer, to, closer and closer together. And just one thing, the nature solutions will do something to help us if we do that. However, the climate crisis is not going to be solved by nature solutions. Just get that in your head. We can do as much as we like to preserve the planet through nature solutions. That's going to keep us going, sustain us. But then, however, it's not going to be the solution to the climate. And here's why. OK, the United Nations predicts that at least 25,000 species are going to go extinct in the next 30 years. Some say closer to a million. OK, I just want to stop here and say, well, some say closer to a million. What does that really mean? What does it really mean, closer to a million? How many species are there in the world? Do you know how many species? I'd like some people, somebody to make a guess and you get a copy of them. OK, guess how many species of, of animals, plants are in the world today? A lot. A lot, OK. A lot. And give me your number. Because it says one, 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 one million. It says one million species. But it doesn't mean anything if I don't know how many species are being really lost. OK. 100 million. 100 million. Ten, okay. ten million. Ten million. Ten million. Ten million. OK, I, I'll take ten million because it's uh, about 8.7 million species in the world today. And um, there may be up to ten million species because we haven't described them. OK, thank you. Okay, next question. Uh, no, I'm not going to go to the next question. But anyway, on the slide here, you can see um, the things that are really hurting us. Invasive species are taking up spaces where they're native species. Native species need to be there uh, to, to maintain what was there naturally. Invasive species come in and they're sterile. They do not help the, the place that you're in. Um, so you're actually, every time an invasive species comes in, it's actually removing the space that can be used by a native species. And uh, this is happening all the time. Uh, you can see the other things in your hip, uh, pollution and so on. Um, resilience, when a tiger comes at me and attacks me, then it's likely not to survive, unfortunately. Um, so, the, the, so we're losing a lot of um, our nature. 80, uh, Ninety-two percent, as I said before, from um, the, the damage we're doing to the environment through our resources, and eight percent from uh, energy. Okay, this slide here just talks about where carbon has been stored. These are years and years of carbon, millions of years, three hundred millions of years of carbon uh, have been stored, and now what are we doing? Every three seconds. We're burning about one million years of carbon that's been stored away. Um, so here's my next question. Um, we're producing all this, this carbon into the atmosphere. When, it, when we talk about two degrees of warming, what does that really mean? So how many degrees of warming was there between the climate minimum and the climate maximum? The last climate minimum was 23 million years ago and the climate maximum was just 10 million years ago. What is that range in temperature? 
that we're talking about between the minutes. Cold is when we have a massive ice front out here. We've been floating amongst glaciers, uh, sorry, <laughs> amongst icebergs right now. Um, we might be hitting one, um, but that would be a great thing. But how, what is the temperature difference between the climate minimum and the climate maximum? Any? Five degrees Celsius. Five degrees Celsius? Five degrees. Okay, getting close. Uh, no, it's eight degrees. Eight degrees uh, between the, the climate minimum and the climate maximum. Climate minimum drew the water out of the sea, and uh, it would have been about uh, 100 meters lower than it is now. And climate maximum it was around about uh, 10 meters higher than it is now. So, who gave me uh, an answer that was close to that? Seven. Seven was over there. Thank you. Okay, here we go. And my next question is, and it's not, this one's not for a, for a book, but how many, this is a question that I think is on everybody's, nobody's mind, because they don't want to address it. So if we were using nature-based solutions to, to actually draw down the carbon that's being produced right now, how many Earths will we need this year to just absorb the amount of carbon we're putting out this year? How many? Nobody has actually even worked on this because it's the elephant in the room we don't want to test. Okay, so I think it's probably at least greater than five. Okay, greater than more than five of us will be needed to, to address the problem of the amount of carbon we are producing each year. So that's not the solution. The solution is getting off coal, getting off oil, getting off these fossil fuels. That is the only way we're going to solve this. Okay, now to Rotary. Um, Rotary has given us uh, four objectives with um, that can be taken below water for, for um, the water carbon, uh, above water for green carbon. So these are they. Conserve nature and biodiversity from species to landscape scale protection. That is one. The second is mitigate climate change by reducing and avoiding greenhouse gases or ensuring that they are absorbed or stored in natural carbon sinks. Now this is, this is one that just tweaks me just a little bit because I have been stressing that the ocean is not for us a carbon sink because when we sink it, the carbon into the ocean, we change it. Um, acidification, uh, heat, all these things are affecting us, which we've heard of in the last few days. Um, anyway, so, so the carbon sink has to be something that's not the water. <laughs> okay. uh, the next is um, to facilitate sustainable and adaptable livelihoods with uh, small ecological footprints that maintain people's social well-being in compatible and flourishing natural systems. That's straightforward enough. But that's what we have to do. We have to work with people to do this. And the, the fourth one is quite surprising for the environment, because when we were talking, thinking about the environment in the first place, we were not really thinking about uh, strengthening um, environmental quality by addressing socio-environmental uh, issues that disproportionately affect marginalized communities. This is great that it's in there. Um, but it's certainly when, when we were focusing on green and blue, this is, this is not there. And then when the, 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 uh, the, um, the first guidelines for the environment came out, I was really surprised by that, but I was really glad to see it was there. And I think we all should be uh, really pleased that that is uh, one of the focuses of the environment uh, as we move forward. Uh, this is um, a slide uh, that uh, Rick showed the other day, or well, it's not exactly that this has the same information on it. So the, the guidelines for, for uh, the environment were set out with eight um, action goals. And these eight action goals I've summarized here as conserva uh, conservation, resources, food, energy, resilience, education, economy, and health. So these were the ones that were embedded previously. The new uh, action goals and new guidance document just appeared on the Rotary International website in the last couple of days. So that is there. Please go to that and look for it, and I'll show you uh, later on how to find that. Uh, there are two, uh, three more goals that are now included. Land use 
As we heard from Liz this morning, land use is an important thing to look at, and, and tools that are associated with collecting data. Uh, innovations, so if you've got an idea for a project that is, a, is innovative and hasn't been used before, we are looking for that in a global grant. Please present that to Rotary International as a global grant. Okay, scholarships, these were always there. However, now they're included in the action goals. And the thing about this is most of the projects that have come forward so far, at least from the most half, 50% of the projects that have come forward have been around scholarships. And protected areas, um, uh, Liz was talking about protected areas of, of reefs and, and oceans and, and uh, other, other areas. Certainly all the mangrove areas, most of the mangrove areas around the world are now protected under some government regulation. Okay, how am I doing with time? Okay, all right. I just want to talk about some threats. Uh, this, this is a slide that talks about mangroves. And so uh, we're talking about mangrove loss, um, losses through climate change, losses through coastal development. We like to build a hotel here. A mangrove is in the way. Okay, uh, pollution. The mangroves uh, just attract pollution, as you saw. Uh, on Bermuda, everything that washes in is not all the stuff that's being thrown as people walk along those paths, it's all washing into the sea as well. And uh, so that's a problem. Uh, in agriculture, at least half of the, the world's uh, mangroves have been depleted by production of shrimp. Now, who ate shrimp in the last couple of days? Okay, uh, I see some people just not wanting to really raise their hand, but yes. Those shrimp have probably come from Ecuador, where at least 50% of their mangroves have been removed uh, to uh, produce uh, shrimp. Once those, uh, those, those areas are depleted, they've, they've actually added so many much chemical in there, they're going to move on to another space. But uh, so after this meeting, actually, I'm flying down to Ecuador to look at two uh, mangrove projects down there. Um, the, uh, the services of, of mangroves. Um, they provide livelihoods for people, they produce uh, a lot of um, income potential, uh, they regulate climate, and I just want to stop here because we think of fisheries. Now, fish, um, mangroves are really good for, uh, as a nursery for fish. And if you're in Florida, then you know that the grouper and the parrotfish come into the mangroves, they stay there for about six years, and then they move out to the, to the reef. They actually then harvest the reef for, for algae um, and the group, of course, uh, take down the, big, the, the small fish. And, and so it's a, a whole uh, ecosystem that, that happens out there. Okay, so I uh, just want to stop here, next book. Okay, question three. Um, what is the most abundant species of, of group of, of organisms that are in mangroves. Okay, okay. <laughs> just one, one. Insects. Insects, insects are above, yes, but they're the most abundant. In the water. Crustaceans. Crustaceans, no. Fish. No. Bacteria, no. Goodness, I can't give this book away. Okay, Who, who's ever heard of a bristle worm? Bristle worm. Okay, bristle worms are the most abundant species of uh, organism that are in mangroves. And you probably haven't even thought about them. In fact, probably this, I, I keep from this room, nobody has thought about uh, bristle worms. So these are part of the you know, all, all types of worms, but uh, they're, they are the most abundant in, in mangroves. They're providing a lot of the food for. Um, the fish and everything else, the crabs, the lobsters, everything else that are in a mangrove, these guys are the, uh, the, the diet of, uh, of the mangrove, of uh, the, the species that are in the mangrove. Okay, so let's go on. Tourism is a big thing. Water filtration, yes, water's coming in, being filtered. A lot of pollution that comes down uh, is being locked away in this, uh, the sediment of the mangrove and coastal protection uh, for people that are behind the mangroves. Okay, uh, just talking a little bit about Bermuda, it's uh, on the left-hand side of this. Uh, so the most 
uh, damage that's going to be happening to the Bermuda uh, mangroves uh, is largely around um, sea level rise and erosion that's happening through sea level rise and some of the yellow in there is actually to do with uh, invasive species blocking out um, the spaces where the mangroves should be growing. And so that's what we were doing uh, yesterday, with, uh, two days ago, uh, was actually removing the, the, um, the, the trees that were there. They'd been working on that for a couple of days. And now um, we did plant some species. And, and Rick, yes, I, uh, you know, Vic, I do know how many plants we've put in the ground um, in, when, when we did that work. So, so we, we do have some capacity on that, but we don't know how many pounds of, of, um, of um, plastics and things we've collected from, from the sea. Okay, <clears throat> moving on uh, to, to what we can imagine what we can do. So I've been uh, tapped to, to be running a program called uh, Mangrove Restoration for Sustainable Biodegoods. Um, COP26 in, in, in Glasgow, uh, the British Commonwealth uh, put together an event Shaker Meadow was there. He uh, really jumped in with that and, and really wanted us as, as Rotary to take on mangroves as, as a, a project. He went, and then he, it's sort of a movable chair. It was started with five or six or seven rounds by uh, mid year, uh, seven, eight, nine, ten, twelve uh, grants by the, <laughs> by the end. So we sort of settled on ten. Um, uh, Jude tasked me to, to make this happen, and then at uh, COP27, uh, Jennifer Jones is uh, going to be uh, presenting the, the, the outcomes of all this work that we've been doing. Uh, the delegation for uh, the Blue Zone at uh, COP27 is uh, Jennifer um, Jude Dement, Keith Madden, who's the environment um, manager for, for Rotary, Mohammed Dalwa from Egypt and myself. Um, okay, did I say that one before? Oh, I'm back. Sorry. We just it. Okay, so in, uh, I'm not going to go through every one of these, uh, whether with a photograph or what we've been doing in any one of these places, but on the Commonwealth side of things, because we had to develop up um, a Commonwealth presentation uh, projects. Uh, we've got 11 countries, uh, probably about 15 or 16 um, actual projects that we're working on, and you can see the, the dollar amounts that are there associated with those projects. One of the things I really want to em emphasize is we've got countries that have these projects do not have a lot of money. They are not producing a lot of money for their, um, in their DDF and their, uh, from their local funds. They need international partners. They need primary uh, partners. So if you're interested in any one of these countries you can see up here, uh, just talk to me, we can find a way of connecting you. I would like every club around the world to be associated with a global project. Uh, that will get you into the water Sorry. Uh, of, of working with, with uh, a, a global grant. Okay, um, I turn it down here in the Seychelles. The Seychelles did not proceed. We actually started working with them. Um, they thought that their mangroves were too small to actually get a global grant together. For that, um, largely the, the problem there is coastal resource um, resort development, and uh, so there's um, we need to work with the government to get to get that to work. Is people pressure population? Uh, people pressure is basically uh, yes, population, uh, collection of resources, collection of firewood, collection of of um, just materials from the, the mangroves, reducing the mangroves' uh, efficiency. Okay. Um, okay, so then, of course, uh, when I'm, I'm asked to work with um, Commonwealth countries, people from non Commonwealth countries are saying, okay, uh, all right, and okay, we need to have uh, some, some non Commonwealth countries there too. So, Bahrain. Um, and uh, you can see these the two from Ecuador that I'm just going to go and visit. Um, then uh, we're building one in Sharm el Sheikh, which is, has a mangrove just a, um, a couple of miles away from it, a couple from the um, Philippines. 
Okay, um, moving quickly through this. Every member project is different. There's no one cookie cutter I can come in and say, this is what we have to do. Um, but what we do have to do, and you can read all those things there, um, but the thing, three things we have to do, uh, we have to do an impactful project, we have to do it measurably, and we have to do it sustainably. Okay. Um, you've heard about some of the ecosystem services, uh, then what we're doing for community development, um, we're plant, doing plant nurseries uh, for those species that they need to grow, um, crab and lobster fattening, honey production, fruit production, tourism, um, educational uh, centres, uh, training and so on, plastics. And yesterday you saw uh, how some plants are really adapted to growing really quickly. These are the bioliferous ones, they, they actually produce live young. Um, so the, the plants are, uh, drop into the water and then they're ready to go. Uh, other ones are like, more like peanuts. They have two big uh, cotyledons that are inside and they're just waiting for the, the shell to break down so they can germinate. And then you have some slower growing ones like the, if you're thinking about a coconut or phoenix palm or so on. Uh, you saw some of this yesterday, so you know, collecting the, um, the uh, biviparous plantlets, you can just poke them in the ground. Well, actually, in, uh, this is in Ecuador, using plastic sheets, believe it or not, they take the sheets off and, and uh, dispose of them. But they, they generate this in a nursery. You can see the, the, the nursery here a bit low. When you've got a low tidal range, this really works well. Um, just needs to have uh, about half a metre of tidal range and then you can do this. And you can then take them out to, to where they need to be uh, grown and this is, this is a part of the mangrove restoration that they're, they're doing. It's, it's really a, the only places where we're doing afforestation. Um, global grants, these uh, you probably already know about. Uh, so uh, just take those in. I've just got to run through this. Um, just uh, these are the new, from the new guidelines, when you're putting together something for a global grant, you have to have a precise locality. You have to have community and, and environmental assessment now. Uh, you have to produce metrics and of, uh, that are linked to the budget. They uh, uh, have to show long-term uh, sustainability. And if you want to work towards a program of scale for any, any project, and certainly with with mangroves, they have to be monitored over a long period of time. And so we'd be probably looking for a program of scale um, to be advanced maybe in six or seven years. And uh, so we have to measure all the good things we, we do. Um, we have to capture that data. And I just want to say that uh, there's a lot of talk about carbon capture and trade, carbon trading. Very rarely does a, a Rotary Club own the space that's putting the plants in the ground. So it doesn't actually own the carbon that's actually being produced uh, or reduced from the atmosphere. It's only when it's done. Uh, just we're getting really close to the end. Uh, of the 42 global grants that have been awarded in the, the last year, uh, 2.3 uh, million, 21 of them were scholarships. They're easy to do. If you, do, if you want somebody to get trained in the environment, uh, this is a, a way to get a master's in that. Uh, five were for environmental education, three, uh, five were for conservation, four were for solar. If you want to put solar panels on a roof of a school, that is now part of an environmental project. Um, agri three are for agriculture, uh, two are for pollution abatement, uh, measuring how much. Um, Pollution is, is uh, in a stream and doing assessment of that, and for two of the so circular economy, uh, plastics recycling. SRAG, I just want to come back to SRAG. This is what, on the, the, the right hand side of the screen, this is what uh, the SRAG can do for you. We want to be involved in every part of any project if you'd like us to be there. Um, on, the other, on the left hand side, it's essentially what a club needs. They need a community assessment, the development of the team. The, the local funding, the resources, the DDF and uh, for global grant. Uh, only DDF makes a grant, a, a, a project a global grant. Um, then project impact reporting, we need to have the data that's associated with every project. Uh, finally, the, there's an abundance of information 
on our uh, website, the, the Rotary International's website. There, um, there are new guidelines that have just come out, there are new, new statements and uh, guidelines and so on. You can just take a uh, through that. And so I can't talk about this today, but I could talk for half an hour on this. This is a typical, this, is, this tells me a whole story about climate change in this photograph. You can see the tiger looking out over a, a space that's been washed away by, um, by a river. You can see the, the lumps of this um, mangrove that's been washed out. This is in the Sundarbans. Uh, there's about 500 years of, uh, in that three meters, uh, three feet of, uh, of soil underneath there, that is stored carbon. Um, and I can just go on and on about this, but. Uh, um, we as humans, we don't like tigers. We, uh, the, the, this is this uh, forest is, is actually um, a forest of uh, date palms. Uh, the, the tigers love to eat. They use the the, the uh, forest as hides. So if we don't like tigers, and we uh, then we're more likely to just remove the whole forest and get it out of the way. Okay, that's it. Thank you very much for listening. Um,